everyone, my name is Lauren and I'm a senior museum specialist in the American Museum of Natural History's Department of Herpetology. And today I'm gonna to take you on a virtual behind the scenes tour of our three collection spaces. At over 2 million square feet and housing more than 34 million specimens, New York City's American Museum of Natural History is one of the largest natural history collections in the world. The herpetology collections began in 1869 with the purchase of the Prince Maximilian collection, and additional specimens began accumulating through expedition fever in the early 20th century. The official department of herpetology was founded in 1920 and curated by the indomitable Mary Cynthia Dickerson, who jump-started the exhibition and collection of reptiles and amphibians. Mary really put an emphasis on outreach through exhibition and wanted to build a library and center for herpetological research. She grew the collection and expanded the research through field work, and all this lives on today in our dynamic and active collection with over 370,000 catalog specimens. Okay, so this is the first stop on our tour. So this is one of our three collection spaces, and this space is what we call the reptile collection. It's actually all of the fluid reptiles, which are in these cases on this side of the room, and then it's all of our tanks. So we actually have 220 stainless steel tanks, and we'll get into some of those in a minute. Just like most collection spaces, everything down here is sorted taxonomically by scientific names. So all the lizards are together and all the snakes are together. You know, within snakes, all the bodes are together. Within bows, all the anacondas are together. So if you know what something is, you can find it on the shelf pretty easily, despite the fact that we have almost half a million specimens. One of the cool things about this space is it's actually part of Building One, which is the original uh, museum building. So the museum was founded in 1869, and the first building started to be built around 1874. And our collection space is actually within that original wall. So if you look back here, um, this is the original uh, outside wall from the 1874 building, um, which is kind of cool that it's just hanging out in our collection space. The majority of our collection is fluid specimens, and we have around 350,000 specimens in 70% ethanol. Most of it is in jars, no jars bigger than a gallon, so I'm actually going to go through and show you some of my favorite alcoholic specimens. Um, so this guy right here, he's really cool, I love him. Um, this is my Greek tragedy in a bottle. Um, so this is a rattlesnake that tried to swallow a horny toad and choked on it and died. Um, and if you look closely, the, the horny toad is still lodged in the rattlesnake's mouth. Um, and if you zoom in, you can actually see it exploding out of the rattlesnake's throat. So snakes can usually swallow things bigger than their bodies. They've got stretchy ligaments in their jaws. Horny toads can actually puff up quite large to try to avoid being eaten. So most likely he got a little big and the rattlesnake couldn't swallow him and he got lodged in his throat with these backward facing spikes that are on the uh, horny toad's face. I love this too because um, in our database it says that they found it dead on the road like this so they just walked up and found it looking like this on the road. This is another really cool specimen that I, I like to bring out a lot to try to have people guess what it is um, because it's not something you often see in herp collections. Um, this is actually the inside of a leatherback sea turtle's esophagus. And you can see it's, it's covered in these keratinized spikes and these face downward inside the sea turtle's esophagus. And uh, the theory about this is, is so, as you know, a sea turtle eats underwater. So when you open your mouth underwater, the water pressure is going to try to pull things back out. And these downward facing spikes actually keep the food inside and allow them to expel water without losing their lunch. And leatherbacks actually have the longest esophagus to body ratio of any, um, any vertebrate. And scientists think this has to do with um, the fact that they eat jellyfish and they're just constantly trying to keep jellyfish in their system. But it is really cool to look at. And these are quite sharp. So like I said, we have 220 steel tanks um, and these steel tanks are for everything that's too big to fit in um, bigger than gallon sized jars or things that we have a lot of like we have um, bags of hundreds and hundreds of American toads, that kind of thing. Um, so this is actually one of my amphibian tanks. So these are our steel tanks. Um, they're on cadaver racks to make them easier to pull out. And everything is stored inside 70% um, ethanol. So just like the jars, uh, the tanks are filled with ethanol as well. 
I really like this guy because it is so big. So this is a giant salamander. <laughs> um, so I, I love this guy because he's actually small. Um, these guys can get almost five and a half feet long, which is just huge. That's as that's taller than me, actually. So you can see this is a little guy. Um, and these guys are from Southeast Asia. And uh, unfortunately, they're almost extinct in the wild due to um, habitat destruction and pollution. They need super clear water to um, breed in, and that's pretty hard to find. It needs to be fast moving because of like oxygen and stuff. Um, and with damming of rivers and stuff, it's quite difficult to find these guys in the wild. Um, uh, these guys are cool too. They sometimes call them um, giant pepper fish because when they get scared, they'll release this like musky, milky substance that smells like pepper to try to deter predators from eating them. Another cool thing about these guys is they, um, they'll lay up to like 200 eggs and the males will actually take care of them. They'll fan them with their tail to make sure they get enough oxygen um, to, to make sure that the eggs can grow well. So yeah, this is our giant salamander. And then I like to cover them with cheesecloth just in case we have any alcohol evaporation that they, they stay moist until we check it again. We check all the alcohol levels every other summer. Um, so I have a group of interns whose summer job is to check the level of every single jar and tank in the collection and make sure that the alcohol levels are where they should be. Because with a collection this size, um, if something evaporates, it could be years before we notice it. So it's actually the intern's job to check and make sure that that doesn't happen. Most of our tanks are the size of the one I just opened, but we have one monster tank that's for some of our really big stuff. So I'm gonna show you my favorite specimen from this tank. So this is our Komodo dragon. Komodo dragons are, are popular because they're the world's largest lizard. They get over 10 feet long, they're, they're venomous. Um, but I really love these dragons because of their history. The Komodo dragons were really known to science starting around 1912, and no one in, in the U.S. had really seen them. So the museum sent an expedition to Komodo in 1926 to collect dragons for the museum. And so they, they brought these guys back in, um, in 1928 and made a diorama for them for the original Hall of Reptiles. And they were so popular in the Hall of Reptiles that they actually had to shut down the hall when it got too busy in the museum. The reason the Komodo dragons were so popular is because they projected a documentary film next to the diorama from the original expedition. This footage set the stage for modern nature documentaries and was so wildly popular, it inspired King Kong. The director was so enthused by Burden's footage and expedition description that he based the main character off of Burden himself. With the sound of the airplane engine you're hearing is actually our minus 80 freezer. So we have over 15,000 tissue samples in the museum's on-site cryo center, but we do have a working freezer in our space uh, for current projects, incoming collections, etc. And this is primarily what our research is on, is on our tissue samples. A lot of our curators, postdocs, and grad students work primarily with the tissue samples. They use them to delimit new species, produce evolutionary trees, and examine the historical demography of populations. Our tissue collection is one of the most utilized things we have. This is our smallest collection space, but it's actually my favorite because this is everything that's too big to fit on the regular shelves. So this is going to be all of our big crocs, big tortoises, sea turtles, everything that's just too big to fit in those um, smaller spaces that we have in the other collection areas. So this is some of our taxidermy. We actually don't have a lot of taxidermy in the department because it's not great for scientific research for the most part. But everything we have that is um, taxidermy is from the original Hall of Reptiles from the 1920s. What I love about the taxidermy is that um, Carl Akeley in the museum is really who started to found modern taxidermy. Carl Akeley is really who started to take the bones of the specimens and they would sculpt muscles and vessels and make these animals look really real and then overlay the skin on top of that, which is why uh, our taxidermy is, is so exquisite and realistic and the dioramas still hold up um, today. They're some of, some of the best in the world and, and these are some examples of it. So even um, 100 years ago, they were really, really great looking. I'm gonna show you one of my favorite big crocs. So, 
So here are some of our of our big crocs. Um, when I have people in for live tours, the first thing they say is, oh my gosh, it has a smell. It's not a bad smell in my opinion, it just is a little bit of a smell. Um, and that's because we don't use any um, any bleaching agents or chemicals to get our, our bones. We actually have a dermastid colony in the basement. So an entire colony of flesh-eating bugs whose job it is to clean the bones for us. So this is our Temistema, which is a false gharial. It's one of our, our bigger specimens. And we have a few of these guys. Um, most of our big crocs um, have come from the zoo in the past. And we don't have a lot of them because of their large size. It's, it's difficult to store large specimens. As you saw, we only have the one oversized tank. So anything uh, really large has to be skeletonized just to make sure it can fit in our spaces. I like this guy too, because you can tell he's a fish eating croc because of his uh, super sharp teeth. They're traditionally found in Southeast Asia as well. And once again, they're another species that's almost extinct in the wild. It's pretty rare to find natural populations these days. So this is our NSB or our new building we sometimes call it. Um, there's uh, quite a few pieces up here. Um, everything on this side of the room is our fluid amphibians, so all of our amphibian jars. Um, everything on this side of the room is our skeletal collection. And we have a few other things in here like our type collection and our larval collection, our hemipene collection. So we're going to take a look at um, a few of my favorite pieces from each of those. My second favorite specimen in the entire collection is a frog. Um, and it's a really cool frog. You may have heard of it before. It's called a Pippa um, or a Suriname toad. Um, sometimes they're called star-fingered frogs, but this is a really cool specimen. So um, a Pippa is, aquatic, is an aquatic frog, and the really cool thing about them is the females actually lay their eggs under the skin of their back. So the, um, the, the baby, the eggs settle into the back skin and it creates this pocket around them and the tadpoles grow inside the mom's back skin into little baby froglets and then they hatch out of her back as fully formed froglets. Um, so what you're looking at here is, is a specimen that's been preserved mid-hatch. So if you look closely, you could actually see that every one of those little holes has a little froglet in it. You can see their little hands and faces peeking out at you. Another cool um, frog specimen that we have. So I showed you the world's largest amphibian in the tank downstairs. Um, here's the world's smallest amphibian. So this is a recently discovered um, genus of frogs from Papua New Guinea called Pedifrini, which means child toad. Um, and you can see that tiny little speck in that jar. And he's so small that I have to put him in a jar within a jar because I don't want to lose him. I can't even tie a tag to him. He's so tiny. These are the smallest terrestrial vertebrates. Well, as I said before, most of our collection is specimens stored in alcohol, 70% ethanol. But we do have a handful of specimens stored in formalin, and those are our larval specimens. Um, so larva is typically stored in formalin um, to prevent shriek shrinkage and damage to the mouth parts. Um, so we have cases of larva at the back of the NSB. I'm going to show you one of my favorite larval specimens. So this is a really special tadpole called a Pseudus paradoxus. So Pseudus paradoxus, the paradox frog. And it's just a giant tadpole, um, the biggest tadpoles actually. They can get up to a foot long. Um, but this tadpole is special because this giant tadpole will shrink to grow into a normal sized frog. So you have like an almost foot long tadpole that shrinks to grow into like a three inch long frog, which is crazy. Um, hence the name paradox frog. It's a paradox how it grows. The scientists weren't sure um, why this is, uh, but they, they're theorizing that these tadpoles don't have to metamorphose. So if you are in a permanent body of water, you may not need to turn into a frog because you can keep eating and have low predation in this, this um, body of water and you can just keep getting bigger and bigger until you have to turn into an adult frog. And they didn't know what they were for years. They were just for seeing these um, these tadpoles in the same ponds as these like little emerald green frogs and it took them years before they even realized it was the same species. This is part of our skeletal collection. We have about 10,000 skeletal preps, um, which is quite a few. And we're actually in the process of rehousing them into um, archival housing. So this is a good example of some of the rehousing that we've been doing in the collection. Um, so here's what some of our nice and rehoused specimens look like in their archival housing with ethophone backs, um, bones put in, the, in small tablets so we don't lose them. It used to look like this. 
things that are still in old cardboard boxes. Um, we have some shoe boxes and cigar boxes on the shelves even. Um, so it'll be nice to get things out of this acidic paper and into archival boxes. Um, so I'm gonna show you some of our skeletons. So this is one of my favorite skeletal press. This is a Gabon Viper, and it's a really beautiful mount. But the thing I love most about this Viper specimen is that Vipers can actually replace their fangs. So they have these selenoglyphic fangs, and it's like the little hypodermic needles you think of when you think of traditional vipers. Um, but they actually have backup ones, so they'll shed their fangs every like six to eight weeks. And when you look at this specimen up close, um, you can actually see the backup fangs on the underside of the skull. Most of our dry material is skeletons, but we do have a, a few non-skeletal items. And my favorite of those are the mummies. So we have natural made and man-made mummies, and I'll show you the natural made ones first. Uh, I don't know if you've ever heard of a shrike bird. Sometimes they're called murder birds. Um, but shrikes are birds that like to save food for later by um, violently shaking them to death and then impaling them on spikes or branches of trees to make little, little jerky meals later. So these are little frogs that have been impaled on the thorns of trees by shrike birds. I also have a couple lizards that are pretty cool too. Okay, so this is my favorite specimen in the entire collection. And I know I say that about everything, but this is actually my favorite specimen in the entire collection. This is a house gecko that was accidentally mummified with an um, Egyptian scribe named Wa. So back during the 20s, uh, the Metropolitan Museum was excavating the tomb of an Egyptian scribe, and they x-rayed this mummy found what they thought to be jewels, amulets, scarabs inside of the wrappings. So when they unwrapped the mummy, they actually found um, not jewels, but a sad little accidentally mummified gecko. Um, so when you make a mummy, you wrap it in um, sticky resin and linen, and that's how they, they wrap them. And this poor little gecko got accidentally stuck to the resin, and instead of um, picking him out, they just left him there and wrapped over top of him. So he had a really bad last day and was accidentally mummified with uh, a real human mummy. And he's my favorite because he is 4,000 years old. Um, so he was mummified around 2010 BC. And so that makes him the oldest specimen in the collection um, by age, so 4,000 years old. But he doesn't look a day over 40. So the mummified gecko is the oldest specimen in the collection by age, but the earliest collected specimens are actually from around 1810. So when the museum was founded in 1869, they started the scientific collections by purchasing the Prince Maximilian uh, Zuvid collection, um, which is around 7,000 specimens. These specimens were all collected in the early 1800s. So this is the oldest thing I have in the collection um, by collection date. This is one of our, our skins from our skin collection. We have around a thousand skins. So this is one of our anaconda skins. Um, it's definitely massive. So anacondas are one of the biggest snakes in the world. They're the biggest snake in the world by weight. So they get the fattest. Um, reticulated pythons can get the longest. Um, but this is still a massive skin. And this is from the Bassler collection. Um, so he was a big South American collector, um, collected thousands of um, herb specimens back in the day. All of our cleared and stained collection. So we have mostly alcohol, some skeletons, and a handful of cleared and stained specimens. Um, they're what we have the fewest of, but they're my favorite because they're the most beautiful. So cleared and stained specimens are specimens that have been uh, turned see-through and have had their uh, cartilage dyed blue and their bones dyed red through a series of chemicals and enzymes and dyes. And this is um, what they used to use pre-CT scanning, x-rays. It's how you can see the internal structure um, of specimens. So these are some baby turtles. And I, I love the baby turtles because you can actually see how their shell is their spine and rib cage. I really like too how you can see that the ribs are individual. And as the turtle grows, the ribs will actually ossify to form a full shell. So if you were to clear and stain an adult turtle, the carapace would be solid red because those rib bones have fused together. 
Another cool thing you can do with clear and stained specimens is actually watch the bones grow. Um, so this is a series of alligators. Um, the smallest is an embryo, and you can see how it's entirely cartilage. The, the next is a alligator that's getting ready to hatch. You can actually see how some of the bones have started to ossify. That's the red. And the last one is a uh, alligator hatchling. It's a few months old, and you can see now that it's entirely ossified and all of its, its bones are in place. Even though clearance staining is kind of a dying art, I still use the process occasionally for specimens that are a little too decomposed to preserve properly. And I do it occasionally for um, exhibition displays. They're really beautiful on exhibit. Holotypes are a um, single physical example of a new species. Whenever you describe a new species, you have to designate a holotype. There can only be one in the world, um, and we have around 720 of them. One of my favorite facts about the holotypes is um, they actually moved them off-site during 1942 during the war to make sure they were protected um, in case anything happened at the museum. Because if anything happens to them, they're pretty much irreplaceable. Specimens like these holotypes and each and every other scientific specimen and resource in the museum's collections are vitally important to protect and maintain in order to be made available to the global community. The museum has over 1,400 visiting researchers annually and loans out a further tens of thousands of specimens to institutions all over the world. Physical collections are not only an irreplaceable record of what the world has, in many cases they also are the only record of what the world has lost. Every specimen is an ultimate source of original evidence, not only for past and current investigations, but for future discoveries. Scientists can investigate these collections again and again, applying new technologies, exploring new questions, and finding new answers. There's no doubt the future will bring new discoveries from these amazing collections.